Okay, so on to the second talk. I assume that most of you here at, uh, attending this specific talk knows about MVC, okay, ASP.NET Core. This is not a how to ASP.NET, this is a hidden gems thing. So some of the things I'm going to be showing exists in, um, in, 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 hind in, in, in hindsight, for instance, but it's not that obvious. So this is me trying to show you guys what's, what's cool, I would say, in ASP.NET Core, which we might not even know about. Um, but first of all, uh, we from the Dutch.net is, is uh, we, we've been doing these meetups for like two years now almost, and, and we've we are nothing without you guys. And thank you very much for coming to these kind of meetups. You you guys are the are the guys that are making this whole thing possible. And uh, please give us feedback how to uh, how to improve and, and and how to do things better. Who am I? Well, I'm Fanny Reinders. Uh, it's quite funny because I'm South African, living in the Netherlands, working for a Dutch, a German telecoms company. So it's a bit, uh, a bit weird. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP, which means I like doing um, community stuff like, like these events. Uh, we are also part of a SDN cast. Um, that's like a weekly Dutch webcast that we do. Uh, and yeah, you can find me on, find me on the internet, rangers.co. It's not .com. And I've got a GitHub um, page, which is... Um, it looks like it's the, there aren't, aren't any activity there, but I'm actually running an experiment with uh, drawing beer in my uh, in my history. So just go ch do check that out. It's 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 quite funny. Uh, I also have a few content out there. Uh, quite recently, I wrote a book on uh, ASP.NET Core. It's available on Amazon, so please go and uh, go and grab it if you if you like to to read my kind of stuff. Uh, but I must do point out that if you're going to be searching for my name on Amazon. You don't want to be searching for fanny pack, so just go and uh, Google my or Amazon my full name, then you will get to my uh, to my content. Okay, so onto the talk, right? So I've sort of split this uh, whole thing up into sort of segments. First of all, application startup. Um, Benjamin, his uh, great presentation on performance. You know, applications need to be as quick as possible. That request that comes in must go out as soon as possible. Things that we can do during startup matters. So we need we need to con constantly uh, think about creative ways of doing our application startup, not just taking the out of the box and just use it, right? For instance, this is a, a, a default inline configuration that we can use of HP.NET Core. Uh, most of you probably knew about uh, this way. Uh, this is like a sort of a uh, inline helper functions that they've wrote. Um, and what it is, it's basically running our application by going a web host that's creating a web host, and it's running uh, the configure, which is a start of the pipeline. And then you have uh, optional configure services, which is the dependency injection services kind of thing. You can do this in line if you don't want a separate uh, startup file class, for instance. But did you know also, this is also one of my contributions of .NET, um, little contribution <laughs> thingy, I've just added a sort of a, a generic type that you can pass into the create de default uh, builder thingy, and uh, you, you can actually have a separate uh, startup class uh, defined like type of T, for instance. And it will look like this, right? So it's a, it's a separate uh, startup class that has the same signature as the, the inline one, obviously now just in a class, but it's the same thing, right? So we, we all know about this, you know, the, the startup configure services and configure method. Who has ever heard about startup filters? Of course, Benjamin. But uh, <laughs> startup filters are great because it's actually not middleware, it's pre-middleware kind of thing. So it executes before the middleware executes. It comes in handy because then you can be doing stuff like uh, password validation, for instance. Right? This is a simple example where I check a, a, a query string of key. If it's not one, two, three, four, I reply as soon as possible you had one job. Instead of going into my pipeline somewhere in my controller validating that. You need to do that as soon as possible, right? Just this is an example, and it looks like middleware because it is middleware, but not really. It's like startup pre-middleware. And this is how, uh, how you use it. You use the interface, I startup filters, or I startup filter interface, and you can implement your own one. Like I've got an awesome startup filter. And you, you add it on your services, and it lights up in your application. Just going back to the configuration as a class, quickly. Did you know you can do conf configuration per environment? Anyone? 
So configuration as a uh, per environment is, is, <laughs> is quite cool because it, uh, it works on convention. So if you have a startup class and you are, for instance, working on a development environment, if you set your uh, development environment in your ASP.NET Core um, when, uh, when running, it will go and look for startup development, your environment name. And it will take that class instead of your, 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 your stock standard one. And the same goes for the methods. It, it, it goes in a, a different level. So if you have configure development services or configure development, it will take those methods instead of your normal ones. So for instance, if you have foo as an environment, you set that, uh, for instance, like um, environmental variable. And you wire up your startup class like uh, to, to scan all, all the assemblies uh, for, for startup classes. It will pick, pick up startup foo if you have startup foo in your application. Yet again, if you have configure foo services and configure foo, it will use those methods in your um, application. But yet again, if you're working with bar as an environment, in one class, you can have foo and bar because it's different methods, right? So it's, it's different things, but it uses different things for different environments. For this example, I'm adding a singleton of iAwesome, for instance, for bar specifically, and for the normal environment, I'm not. Think about it. This is great things. When I saw it at first, I was like, Phew. imagine the possibilities you can do, right? So think about these kind of things you can do. It's not entirely helpful always, but think about those things you can do. The reason why we're doing you know, HTTP applications is because we're working with servers and clients, right? We, we have clients that talk to servers and, and some, sometimes back again. But these two core components makes our, our job, right? So HTTP calls is request response. Did you guys know you can do your own server? I know, Benjamin, you know. <laughs> by implementing iServer, by the way, Kestrel, you, you, we all know Kestrel. Kestrel is the HTTP server that's cross-platform, blah, 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 marketing. It implements iServer. So you can write your own iServer, or you can write your own server, HTTP server, and use it in your application instead of Kestrel, if you're really up for it. You know? So it got me thinking. And, and by the way, it's, it's, it's quite quite easy. Uh, the, uh, the interface dictates you have to have a features collection and a stop, start and a stop. And to make it an HTTP server, you need to have minimally a request feature and a response feature, because that's a request response. You need to in, uh, support those features, otherwise it's not an HTTP server. Quickly how it works, a uh, server's um, responsibility is to take a request from the wire turn that into a HTTP context and put it into your, H, uh, into your application's pipeline, there's a request. Your application does its magic. It comes back with a response, an HTTP context, and it's another job is to take that context and put it back on a wire. That is it, nothing else. It's not that hard. So that's, that's why you have TCP servers and HTTP servers and all that, because it's different mechanics it's working on, right? So it got me thinking, why not we build our own awesome server? It's the same as reading from a network port, but it's, but it's actually reading from a file. So imagine we have a file that gets dropped into a folder, and our application picks up that file as a request. The same request that, H that Cache will give you, it will just read from a file instead of a network. It doesn't solve a business problem, but it's cool. Right? Just to give you an idea what we can do. So here we have text going in. It turns it into a request, a response coming out, and it, um, this is not right, but it gives you back the response, whatever response the, the, the server um, spawned up. And of course, we need some, some kind of standard, some kind of uh, specification on how we're going to read the request, because HTTP have get, space, HTTP, this whole thing. So we just defined in our awesome server, defined a request is the method space to request. It's the simplest thing I can come up with. In the text file, it will look for this syntax, and it will parse the request and uh, convert it into a uh, HTTP context. So quickly, <coughs> sorry, my throat is killing me. Quickly demo. I'm not going to go code by code and line by line, really. I'm just going to show off the, the cool bits. So here I have three files. Uh, the one is going. Um, just uh, get API hello. 
other one is uh, just uh, in the API hello is just returning a normal uh, hello uh, string, a hello world string. And the second one is actually returning a JSON object. And the third one is an uh, image, right? It's normal endpoints. But note that these are in files. Okay? And the, this is the controller I'm hitting. So it's uh, get hello world and JSON and get image. I uh, am using Visual, uh, I'm vis using Visual, uh, Visual Studio Code to sort of show you this, not to go into the whole Visual Studio uh, thingy. Uh, I have a, let me just see here. Oh yeah, missing a, uh, a folder here. I have a process folder. Now take a look what, ha what is happening when I put this there and my server is running already. Take a look what is happening on the right hand side when I drop these three files. Oh, by the way, w so let me just quickly go back to the code before I skip skip something here. So w uh, what it is doing, where's my, it's breaking, it's hanging, why is it hanging? It's hanging, someone help me. Gerald, first place. <laughs> Can't. In any case, let me show you. Uh, hopefully, that will. Oh, okay, they're dead. Yay. Um, and this is how I set it up for. So, so I have a. I have a program CS, and I use my awesome server. I don't use Kestrel. I use my own awesome server, and I specify my inbox path and my outbox path, i.e., where the request is coming from and where to set the response all folders. So let's run this bad boy and see how it uh, how it works. So it's running in the background already. So I, technically if I take these three files, moving it to inbox, see it's running my pipeline. It's running my, my application code, right? And it's going into those into those endpoints, it's doing its things. And on my outbox, there's like files happening. So if I quickly go and sniff this one, uh, of course, I need to open it with Notepad. There's the JSON, the image. There's Hello World, and the image is, of course, something like Obama, I think. There's Obama. So j that just shows you how that uh, mechanism can work without any sort of uh, any complexity. Quickly going into the code, it's uh, not, that, not that complex, really. I'm not going to go into details. This is on my GitHub page. Uh, so yet again, what I've said here, is a server, a, a, a class that implements iServer. I throw in my options and I throw in my service provider because I'm, I'm, I'm a big boy, I'm, I'm using service uh, 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 dependency injection correctly, right? So I, I need my service provider to, to wire that up. And here, I set my features. So I, I, I want the request feature and response feature, but also to be able to work with dependency injection, I just add my service provider feature and then it will, it will work. Do go look at this code. It's it was quite uh, quite an adventure to to get this working, but you know because it, when it starts, I just add a folder watcher, which is underlying that just like a Windows file system watcher. It just watches that folder, and upon that file gets picked up, it does something because it has a context, and it reads from that context and it puts it through the pipeline, and it and it works. And the same goes for the for the stop. My stop just completes a task here, but when I go to the folder watcher, eventually, I can actually do this. There we go. So when it's created, create a new context, um, and then task.run, wait for changed. That is it. As easy as pi. Yeah. I have no idea how it works, but it's the normal uh, uh, Windows uh, when a file changes thing. I can probably configure it, but I, I believe it pulls it, right? Passes the watcher. Yeah. Uh, I think it actually, I think it's even lower level now. I think it's a confidence notification. What he said. <laughs> so I've, I've, no, I've no idea how it works. That's implementation details. But my, my point is to, to, to more on the iServer kind of thing. But you can use anything you want as long as you implement iServer and then um, you're good to go, right? So that's the server part. And moving out, uh, I'll shift our focus back to the client again. We all are using this guy. We all are using the HTTP client, right? Everyone? Everyone? 
a bit of problems with this guy lately because you know it's it's good it implements i disposable but um yeah when the object is is gone it doesn't mean the connection is gone so it, it keeps the connection open that gives you a risk of socket exhaustion etc 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 you can sort of solve it by using a singleton instead of a transient uh, because what happens underlyingly when you creating a new object every time you instruct the windows to or the operating system to open up a new port uh, so imagine you have so many connections you need to do in so many requests and stuff it's going to fire up a new connection every time so the solution to this is to use a singleton but that doesn't really solve the problem you you, you will probably get something like uh, dns time to live issues uh, still uh, and it's fairly hard to test i don't know if you, uh, some of you have ever tried to mock a http client before it's a nightmare <laughs> but it's 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 doable but it's 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 very hard to test so to our rescue comes the http client factory this is a ASP.NET Core 2.1 or .NET Core 2.1 specific client. It works cleverer with the whole connection polling. Um, so it's actually a, f a, a factory that allows us to create HTTP clients in a more clever way, right? Uh, it's easy to test and it comes with the four consumption patterns, direct, named, typed, and generated. Now generated, I don't mean about code, it's during the runtime it generates that client, which is wow. So quickly going to the direct usage. I, uh, sh should I stop for photos or something? <laughs> now, yeah, I, I, I'm just looking at time. That's why I'm, I'm flickering free. But I can quickly go back for if you want to take a photo. These slides are available on my um, speaker deck uh, profile as well. But um, I can also make it available. Send me email. I'll send you back. Tell me friends. <laughs> yes, it's live on SDN cars. Go look it back. So we, this, this is recorded. So you don't have to take photos, really. But please do my guest and uh, do it. Direct usage is quite simple. On your services uh, collection, you just add HTTP client after installing that NuGet package. I, uh, I believe it is a NuGet package right now. And that is it. And using that is you inject your HTTP client factory in whatever, in wherever you're going to use it. And then let's say, for instance, on my get uh, action, I want to be creating a client to, to go to the awesome API from here. You just use the factory to create a client. You don't new one up. You just ask the factory for the client. Then you add your configuration, like uh, headers and whatever, and you instruct it to get a URL. In this case, it's getting a foo, a foo endpoint. And that is it. That's the most basic example how you can use HTTP Client Factory. Named client is quite interesting because that configuration now lives, the previous example, it now lives in our business part of the application. If we or the controller part of the application. If we, this name client allows us to, to glue the configuration to the client itself and give it a name. In this case, I just call it awesome because it's an awesome client, just give it a name awesome. And then at one place, define the configuration because it, it belongs there. Imagine the previous example, you can still do that overall, but you, then you have to duplicate your logic again and again and again for all the places you want to be using it, which is not wrong, but it's not right. The name client uses is the same principle. You just inject your factory, and instead of just saying create client, you ask it for a specific name, and it comes bounded with those settings. You can just use it. That's great. A type client is even better, because now you can actually tell it to give me a, 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 add a HTTP client of a type of class, you know, in this case, awesome service. There's a rule. Your, ser your class needs to be a specific signature. It needs to have a constructor with at least an HTTP client as a parameter in the constructor. So, the, so this is the, the, the schematics of the, of the awesome service. It, it expects, you can still have your other dependencies, but it needs to expect at least a HTTP client in the constructor. Then you can do your thing, because then you have a HTTP client, because the factory gives you that client during runtime. You configure your normal stuff in this strongly typed um, service class, and you give it a strongly typed name like foo, and that maps to the foo endpoint, obviously, right? And it returns a string. That is it. You configure it one place. Then using it is quite cool. Instead of injecting the factory, now you can just inject your service, and it will work. You can just go awesome service dot foo. It's much more readable. No magic strings. A lot of magic happening in the back. 
Then there's always the generated client option. This is my favorite. Uh, any refit guys in the in the room? Who has ever heard of a refit? See the Xamarin guys are putting up their hands, which is cool. A refit, in short, is a runtime generator for HTTP clients. See, it's all it all is, um, it all boils down to your, your your contract. So you define your interface of your service, and you glue your in, your refit specific stuff. So for instance, this awesome service, I make it I awesome service interface. You design the contract of the interface, and you say, if I get to foo, I want it to be implementing the foo function returning string. Refit will handle the rest for you, because underlyingly, it will const uh, construct a client that will go to foo, and it will expect the string back to sort of put it in the rest return type for you. And refit in itself has a factory. so. Instead of passing in an uh, uh, instance, you can pass in a factory for the factory. <laughs> so imagine this. You can have ser uh, services.add type client pass in a factory. Tell it it's a refit. You can use any factory you want. The refit, uh, give me a REST service for my interface you just know about. Almost fell. And then using it is quite cool. Cool. Uh, because not working. Using it's quite cool, and this is how the, w the way the world is supposed to be working. Pass in interface, and use the interface as guard intended to. You know? Do this. Don't do the HTTP client thing, please. Spare us all the horrible details. Sorry, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I, b I believe it is, well, it's, it's managing, managing the, the, the connections on the OS level, uh, level. Maybe you have something a bit better to add. To yeah, something I didn't talk about in my talk was the, uh, <coughs> the new implementation of HTTP2. Mm -hmm. um, basically, if you're running on Windows Server 10 or Server 2016, you get to take advantage of HTTP2, which allows you to reuse a persistent connection for multiple resources. However, if you're on any older platform, then you're stuck with HTTP 1.1. As a result, the connection is open, the object itself may stay in memory, but the connection will be forced to be closed mm. after retrieving the resource. Okay, so, so just so I understand, the factory is actually ensuring that they're going to close unless you're using those HTTP 2 points. Uh, and again, uh, that also only applies, HTTP 2 only applies if you're running over a TLS endpoint as well. So um, you've got to have both encryption and either server 2016 or Windows 10. If either of those two things aren't true, you're stuck with HTTP 1, basically. So single request, single resource. But also the underlying infrastructure is handlers. It also uses handlers um, underneath the covers to for this thing to light up. Uh, who has ever heard about hosted services? I'm not talking about this guy that had uh, the poor woman's name incorrectly. Is it Miss Universe or something? I, don't, I have no idea. Who has ever heard about hosted services before? So it's like background. It's like background workers for your for your service, basically. No, no, hosted services. So it's a it's a it's a background sort of a task scheduler thingy you can um, you can run in your application. So normally it's like a Windows service, but it's in a web world, right? And also it has interface, which is uh, which is quite cool. So it's it's called iHosted service, how obvious? And it has also like a server, it has a start and a stop. Just like you want your service to start w when your application starts up, yeah. Do you mean hosted services like? No, I, I mean actual hosted services within your ASP.NET application. No, yeah. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Um, in any case, so see this as a sort of a, a, a thread that's doing something at the background while the application is accepting requests in the same application instead of having an instance of your uh, service as a Windows service or something else. So you have start and stop, and you configure it by just adding a singleton as a hosted service, and you're good to go. So this is what I did. I've done a whole quick example, and this is also the, the simplest I can get it. Uh, this is like a caching mechanism that pulls uh, tweets from Twitter for a certain hashtag, uh, and then it just gets the, a bunch of tweets, reads it into CSV, puts it in the file, and my website can do things with that CSV file. I don't know how cool that will be, but that's how this example works. So Hello, deal with it. <laughs> It's the hello world of .NET stuff here. So uh, this is quite an example. So I've, I've got uh, start async. This is, there's a bug here. Um, 
if I had my book here, I would have sort of auctioned my book up, yeah, because th th there's a bug in this code. There's a while missing around my pull tweets for, for the guys that has eagle eyes. So in any case, when it, when it starts, I pull the tweets. And then when I pull the tweets, basically asking Twitter for a specific tweet from a certain uh, uh, identifier, loop through them and chuck it into a file, and you're good to go. We're appending it to that file. And it's con constantly running. You can have a timer, like wait for five seconds and try again, or five minutes, or whatever. But the idea is a separate work, se separate thread, while the application is, is still working. So we talked about clients, we talked about service, we talked about hosted services, which is like somewhere here. Um, let's talk about the resty stuff. And uh, the, the whole God forbid word, rest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the whole, in ASP.NET 2.1, there's this new API controller uh, attribute that got introduced, which is quite cool. Uh, for instance, w when we look at the old world or the older version of ASP.NET Core or, or even the, the ASP.NET full framework, uh, how it works, if you have your model state, you have your model, you put your, if you're a good boy, you will put in your validation, your model, instead of inline ifing it, putting it in a model, and then every time, if your model gets, uh, if your request gets requested, and you're requesting with that specific mo model, you you stuck with model state is valid every time, and you have to handle it manually, right? And sometimes you miss the boat, and you go to your mom and cry, and the world's just ending in like despair, and then end up uh, being a speaker at dot dot net. I'll just stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just stop. <laughs> so in any case, so API controller is like an attribute. It does the work, work for you. You decorate your API controllers with API controller attribute. And underlyingly, it will automatically respond with uh, validation errors. It will automatically call your model state is valid on your model if it receives a, a invalid um, payload. It also comes with smarter bindings. I don't know why they haven't um, rolled it out previously. The previous uh, uh, version, 2.0 and pre prior, when you have a post method and you expect a complex type, you always have to say from body to read it from the body. They've now switched it around. If it's a post and you're expecting a complex type in your, in your function, it's probably going to be from the body. So it's going to be inferred. So you don't have to do that anymore. It's done automatically. And the same goes for queries and, and, and routes and that kind of thing for gets and stuff like that. Um, but just to note, it, it requires attribute routing, so you have to explicitly uh, label your actions with, with routes. It doesn't, it doesn't work on the normal routing mechanism. Then there's this guy, action result of T. It's, it's an action result, but it's a wrapper for your action result. So meaning, if you have a function, I'll show you an example now. If you have a function or, or, or action result or action function thingy, you have a return type. Normally, that return type is, it, it can be a, 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 f a fixed return type, like a, like a concrete one, like string or whatever object, like foo or whatever. <coughs> but if, like in REST, when you va want to validate that, it needs to return a validation response, not an object. So you technically need to return uh, not found or 401 or whatever. That's a HTTP response message. So now, how can you return two things at once? You know? And to solve that, we have I action result. Uh, but you know, then you have to s return OK with your payload inside there, or that sort of solves it. Action result type of T allows you to sort of define your action result, uh, the response as action result, but say, if you happen to have a value, you can just return that value straight. You don't have to create a new result like OK. It infers OK from your, from your object, for instance. This is a typical example with a, a, a number class with uh, like validation uh, stuck to the view model or the DTO. Uh, number one and number two. Number two it has, is limited between one and hundred. And then you have your calculator controller with its uh, API controller um, attribute linked to it. Did you guys know you can do this? Add required to your uh, inline parameters and make it required inline. It's the same as doing this, but it's on that label. Because numbers itself can be null. 
In any case, so moving on, I'm returning an action result of int. For instance, this allows me to return an int. And if it's not actually going to that result, if the, secret, if the key is not secret key, I just return unauthorized, which is an action result. So it's a wrapper for your result. I'll just let that sink in quickly because it, that's quite cool. The version coming in 2.2 .2 will be even addressing more of these kind of resty stuff that will allow us to write less and less code, focus more on our API instead of trying to show off at meetups who is, who is the better REST implementation. Don't think about these kind of things. There's a spec for that. Just read it. Yeah. So I'm just saying something because your numbers is obviously quite a complex object. It's got a second thing there called key. Is that yes. So, so, so what it will do is this will be inferred from query, the query string, because it's a string. If it's a complex type, you don't have to say from body. So it will take the, 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 the key from the query string and the, and the numbers from the body. Um, yeah. There are conventions. I'm getting to conventions later, but you can rewrite a MVC to make it read from wherever you want. Who has ever heard of RFC 7807 before? I don't even. So basically, that's a, that's a specification on validation, machine to machine validation, but it's human readable. For instance, if you get a, four, uh, a 400 exception, currently it's just a number, but now they, they sort of standardized it in, the, in an actual response that looks like this. You will get a standard response that specification dictates you have to have a standard response that has errors and what is wrong, right? This is built into the uh, ASP.NET 2.1 already. If you're using API controller, it will generate this payload. Not all of it, because the rest is like custom, I'll show you now. At least this. If you just decorate it there and you have an invalid model, it will generate this automatically. You don't have to do it, which is quite cool. And then you have the other stuff, which is like the documentation kind of things. For instance, if you want a specific title or go, go read the docs, the sort of detail, you can add it, and I can show you quickly how to do that. And it's by matter of configuring your API behavior options. And you just specifically say on an invalid model state response, create a new validation problem details um, class, and then populate it with the stuff you want to be populating with. And Give it, give it a certain content type because it's not JSON, it's actually JSON with a problem. That's the, the proper way of doing it. And just leave. And it will s the MVC framework or the ASP.NET framework will sort it out. It will pick it up and it will populate your, your um, invalid states with these configuration you set up. Model binding. That's like, that's, that's cool. That's the M in MVC, the model binding thing. Who has ever heard about the iModel binder before? Okay, so MVC runs, specifically MVC runs using model binders, right? So it has interface, like bind model, but it works on, 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 on different, um, oh, sorry, not, not that, sorry. MVC has a model binder, and it's, but what model binding basically is, is taking whatever you get, like text or, or JSON, and it binds it, an object and mo a model binders job is to it has rules to know where to get the information from to make an object so I was thinking how cool would it be if you have an awesome model, model binder that given a certain photo that has pictures of uh, people's emotions on you just chuck it to our service and we expecting in our uh, action uh, in our action parameter, we're expecting a strongly typed object pre-filled with emotion statistics without doing anything. So underlyingly, it will go to Azure and go, go, it will hit the face API and don't do this, but it's a cool demo. <laughs> it will hit the face API and it will get back the data and it will bind that data to your, to your model. Let's quickly see how it works. So here I have a Guy, I don't know what his name is, but he's making me a lot of money right now. My book, thank you, Guy. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So this is a, a, obviously an image with a, a few expressions the guy's making. 
And uh, I'm just going to run the demo. By the way, uh, this, is, this, is, this is an awesome uh, extension in VS Code. Uh, it's, it's called, uh, let's see what it's called again. It's called Restlined. It allows you to inline, do, it's, it's like a Postman for Visual VS Code. Instead of opening Postman, you can just go do your post request and just click this button. So in this case, that image you just saw, this is the exact image just in Base64. I'm, I'm shoving Base64 to my service, as is, with like boundaries and stuff like that, but it, it's the same image, trust me. Now I'm sending my request to my server, and as a response, I just made it so that it will send me back a the data it got from Azure just as is, but the, the point is it's a strongly type object, and I haven't done any logic on top of it in my controller. So that image has a few statistics on anger, fear, and happiness, and all that kind of things. How does that work? Well, it turns out it's not that difficult. So if we have our example controller, there's no ifs and model binding happening here. So I expect an emotional photo DTO object in here. And I'm just returning the scores. But the point is I'm expecting an emotional photo DTO object in my body. But where am I actually binding this guy? So it turns out it's a, it's a custom model binder. So if I go to my emotional photo DTO, I decorate it with a model binder attribute, and I tell it it's type of awesome model binder. Whenever you work with this object, go use the model awesome model binder. It will, it will give you information you need. You can even get rid of the attribute and do it in the configuration step and define it one place, and it will work. So in this case, it's binding the photo and it's, it's giving the output as, as, as bytes and also a, a dic dictionary of, uh, of scores, for instance. So the model binder, like I said, it has a bind model async. There's my subscription key. I just want to minimize that. I'll change it later. And it does a few things. So most importantly, it's, it reads the photo. Uh, from my request. So here, if I go to back to my request, my form data photo is this. So it reads my photo. And it hangs again. What's happening with VS Code now? I'll just, ah, there we go. It's uh, going south again, yeah. In any case, something is something's happening in my computer. Any, ah, what? There we go. Um, and it, it's, it's reading a base64, and then it's, it's getting those bytes, and it's passing it to my uh, get emotion result uh, function, which is going up to Azure and requesting the right things to get the result, right response back. And it's creating my, uh, my model. And that's it. Th the point is, logic is at one place. It's like Automapper, but it's model, model level, kind of, kind of cool goodness. Okay. Jackie Chan, cool man. So getting to conventions. Uh, so MVC is also, uh, ASP.NET is also uh, a, a quite a cool fan of conventions. Itself is a conventional uh, framework. So it, it's built on conventions. So when you have, I don't know if you notice this, but you can have controllers without inheriting from controller. By having a suffix controller, it's enough. It will know it's a controller automatically. It's also one of the things I haven't showed yet, but it's, it's, it's like so last year. Everyone knows that. <laughs> um, so built on that logic, you can have your own conventions that you can implement. For instance, if you don't like controller, if it's like a swear word to company, you can replace it with API. It will work. For instance, this is an experiment I've done. So imagine you want an endpoint called API people names to be able to do, do, the, do the request like this, you, we need to uh, add funky stuff to our routes and you know, do, do all sorts of cool things to make it happen, right? If you define a, if you define a uh, this is also a wrong slide. If you define a convention, it will take care of it. So in, in this case, this is the, the thing I was talking about, the suffix and the get. Right, so if you, have a, if you have a get method name, it infers it's a get request. You don't have to say it's a get. Right? It's basic things. Oh, by the way, do you guys know you can do from services in line? 
instead of injecting it in the constructor, you can define from services a as a parameter, and the dependency injection uh, container will hand it to you in line. So why you want to do this? Because at one, why have it on constructor level if it's only going to be used at one place? So you use this method. So the conventions can happen on, on different levels. So you can have application-wide conventions, you can have controller-wide conventions, and yeah, you, you can have uh, action-wide conventions. Uh, and the signature is basically the same. It has apply and it has an application model, controller model, action model that you get passed in. The whole idea behind the convention is whatever you're doing, as long as it ends up as application model uh, or as a controller model, as action model. Whatever you're doing, it needs to happen. It, ne it needs to go to that, to that uh, structure. This is a visual uh, representation where you have an IPA explorer. I, I've been drinking too much beer. <laughs> IPA. <laughs> you have filters. You have got uh, IPA, IPA explorer and filters again and actions, uh, so on and so forth, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <coughs> so, getting back to my thing I want to show. So imagine you don't like controller, uh, you want to replace it with names. Imagine a class like names API with a normal get. You can even re remove this from services if you really want to, because you can infer that as well. If I expect a interface in my parameters, it's most probably going to come from dependencies. So programmatically you can add it in. Why define that? Right? So these things you can do. And string uh, a string array, and this is then replaced by the actual result of, of, of the return type. A quick demo. <coughs> I think it's this one. Right, so I have my names API. Also, um, note that my, um, that my request is going API people names. Right, it's mapping to my name's API into that namespace API dot people dot names API. So from the namespace and the class, it figures out the route. That's how you can sort of define it instead of explicitly giving it in magic strings. Just because it's namespaces, just use namespaces for what it's worth. That's the kind of the idea. So yet again, we have API people names, send a request. Hopefully, we'll get the cruel response back. There is the response, which is great. Underlyingly, it's using a, I'm doing it all wrong again here. Underlyingly, it is doing, in the configuration, I'm adding my MVC, and I tell it MVC to add one of the conventions, my own convention called awesome convention, that sorts out that stuff for you. Note if you say add, it will whatever conventions it has, it will add it to the bottom. So if if you still fall into the previous criteria, it will use those conventions first and not get to your convention, because you can have multiple conventions. You go insert and zero. You can also do that to insert at a specific place, because maybe you not want to clear your collection. See, that's that's also what you can do. So to say ignore MVC, what it's doing, I want to use my own one. You can say dot insert zero. It will go at, at at very first stack because ABC adds its own conventions as well. Looking at the code, please, it's uh, horrible, but bear with me. I'm working on application level, so I'm, I'm scanning my assembly that ends with all the classes ends of API, and that's my controllers. So I do a quick rename to scan the API from them. I create a controller model because that's a controller. I need to put it in a controller model, right? Then I give my, con my model a name, which is that controller name. And then I, for my API Explorer, I need to create a route for it. So I need, then I create a template, whatever the namespace is, do a slash my controller name, and that is it. Same with actions, and so on and so forth. So here you would be able to go dependency injection automatically if, it's a, if that parameter is, because you have the parameter, right? So you, you can go action.parameters. If that parameter is type of a, or is interface, you can add that uh, from services automatically. 
get again I'm not going to go deep into this code but this is how it works and it's 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 quite great and it's very easy if you get into it the flow of things as long as it goes to the MVC model they defined you're good to go with your convention okay almost time to have some beer all right so uh, this is the wrong uh, wrong file pardon me Application parts. Who has ever heard of or uh, who has ever been using application parts? MVC itself is an application part manager. We, we just don't do, uh, know that. Did you know if you have a, imagine you have a solution and you have a class library and you have controllers in that class library and views and that kind of things and you have an actual MVC application and you reference that class library and you compile and you run your controllers will be available in application automatically because it scans all the assemblies for controllers, right? And it builds an application model with the application parts and that's, that's your application. So that's how it works. So you don't have to do funky stuff, it's there already, you just have to reference it. But you can also do something like with application parts, you can read from an assembly. You can, uh, uh, I don't know you, why you want to do this specifically, but it's cool. You can have your application start up and the runtime classes that's only available in runtime, for instance, on this random folder, I've got an awesome DLL with all my controllers and, and conventions sitting on server level. On my local computer, it, it doesn't have it, but when I run it, it has that lo nice logic there somewhere. Think about it as third party plugins or whatever. You just add application part and give it assembly. And it will still it will pull it in as you would have referenced it automatically, and it will work. So that got me thinking. We are all are building microservices, right? This is nothing to do with microservices, but in any case, uh, how cool would it be instead of reading our application from a local disk, just read it from Dropbox? So just just deploy an application to bro some other team can deploy that application to Dropbox. When I run my application, whenever it will just read that. Uh, assembly from there, and it will it will work. What can possibly go wrong? Can possibly go? Yolo, uh, huh? Yeah, but source control happens before that because imagine, yeah, that's 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 true. <laughs> but that team already released to Dropbox. Yeah, it's just release yes. Yeah. Okay. So, right. So let's see. Where is this demo? So this is a class. Uh, it's called a full controller. It has an endpoint external foo and it just say hello from foo, right? This is running on my Dropbox share API. I have compiled it and put it in Dropbox, API.dll. I created the link. Nowhere in my application there is a controller, just to prove a point. And nowhere in my bin there is a reference to foo.dll. When I start up my application up, I say configure services, add external MVC, and I give it a URL. And that's not dangerous at all. That's not dangerous at all, right? Not at all. So you give it a URL, where to pull the information from, right? And then the rest goes for itself, you configure things. So this is an extension method. So where am I just quote Gary Bernhardt for you? That's not an example of why, that's an example of how awesome AS is but if you actually do that in production, then yeah. why? I, I must add, all these things I'm showing you is cool or are cool, but do beware, right? So <laughs> just just to be aware, you can piss off your system administrator or someone somewhere, right? But it's just to show you what what is cool. It doesn't that doesn't go back to your your bosses. Just try to do this, like he said, just to show you what is cool. To to think have you think differently about the, the framework. And here I'm newing up a HTTP client. <laughs> Any case. So this, uh, again, is to, to prove a point. So add external MVC is just reading the byte array from that URL, loads it into the assembly, and gives my give my assembly to my application part. Wow. See, are we going to be, s are, are we sure this will work? Well, let's try it out. So I've started my application, and up upon startup, it will do that. So it already, it, the demo already ran, but just to show it works, right? So it was working previously with, with uh, Azure. So, 
So, hello from Foo Works from Drop Dropbox now. So, <laughs> so in any case, so it's a, this is a response, and to prove a point, if you go, for instance, uh, kill this guy, go to my uh, Dropbox uh, thingy. Can I rename this? Where's my shares? Where, where do I? Who knows Dropbox? Yeah, there we go. And then? Copy. I don't want to view that. Click. No. Oh, there we go. This is what I'm looking for. Rename. Yeah, but it will still... Will it work? No. Just, just delete it. Okay. It's not on Dropbox anymore. Right? My deal. It's gone. So, technically now when I run this application again, it should die and go to hell. It will be funny if it actually runs. <laughs> Boom. So yeah, four or four, which is a good sign. All right, so it works. <laughs> Yay! In any case. But yeah, security is a concern. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't do this. Don't do this, but this is just demo application parts from the next level kind of thing. I've got to say, for an internet team, that would be amazing. You could have it totally separate, you know, as we say, we talk about microservices and stuff, you've got different teams working on different components, and you just do it in the middle, and you've got teams on and, uh, yeah, internal stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the problem also is that's, ju that's just one DLL. Yeah. If you're not going to be uh, uh, statically linking your DLLs to one DLL, it, you're not going to be downloading 50 DLLs. So you probably want to be doing an, a new get package or something, yes. and then do its have it do its thing, right? So there's something you can do. I was going to say, if you, um, in, in theory, what, where that would be really interesting. Um, I've seen. Has anybody heard of Blazor? Yeah. yeah. A few people. Yeah. It's interesting. <coughs> Again, what he said. <laughs> I'm not going to repeat it because uh, you, you don't have audi audio now. So, but uh, hopefully it will p p pick up yeah, yeah. through the mic. But thanks for the add-on. All right. So, who has ever heard of this word before? Yeah, I know half the crowd is like, "What the fuff is that?" Right? Um, it's called hypermedia as the engine of application state. I still see some of you going like, "What?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> Relax. Basically, it's a way of the server and the client be con totally being separate from each other, not sharing, not having the state at one place. For instance, here's a good example. A client, and this is also maybe a good way of, 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 of doing like sort of uh, service point discovery kind of thing. So the client asks the server on the options endpoint. That's a good point to say options, what can you do? right, on, on the root level, what can you do? So it goes options root. The server understands that, and it responds back, hey, okay, uh, you, you want to you wanna know what I can do? Well, I can do this. Uh, there's, m there's yourself, which is options dash. I can also list foo, I can list bar, and list bash, and there is the URL for it. I don't keep it on the client. I, my server gives me the URL on the fly. And its the response is a JSON Helios, for instance, response. It's not a specific JSON response. Then you can pick one because now the client knows about names, not about the uh, URLs. Yeah. I was going to say basically this is the REST equivalent of depending on has to deal with whistles or safe contracts, where you go and access the URL and it tells you all the methods available. This is the JSON REST equivalent. Yeah. Basically. Yes, exactly. So you can imagine you have a Swagger endpoint, for instance. It is the same thing. You, know, you can still use Swagger on the line leaf with it. Swagger. Yeah, exactly. So now you're going to say, hey, I want to use list bar. And whatever URL g you gave me, whatever version it was, I don't care. I, I don't keep track of URLs. So I keep track of names. 
get me the, get me the bar, which is unlinely going API bar. The server says, hey, OK, great. There's another JSON uh, ADO's response. Uh, that's, that's who you are, and this is how you create a bar, and there's your data, whatever you requested. It's like a wrapper. And it says, OK, I want to create a bar. So create bar. It will go API bar, post. The server says, OK, great. I've just created that bar for you. Uh, this is what you can do. You can go remove that bar. You can update that bar. You can list that bars. And there's the data you've just created with the URLs and so on and so forth, like deleting. OK, I've just deleted it. This is what you can do. So it's like navigating your API. The web is, not, uh, it, the web is nothing different. When you go to a web page, google.com or reinders.co if you want to read my blog, you don't tell it exactly where, if you get my links, you click on the about me or whatever. You don't specifically go to that URL. That link is rendered on a server. It has a URL bound to it. If you refresh my page, it's, it's all the time. It's dynamic. That's how the web works. You navigate through pages. Why should our REST services be different? Why should the client know about URLs? The server should tell it about URLs. Because the server evolves, the client uses it. So a quick demo about Helios. And I've, wrote, uh, I've written a, a NuGet package for this. Uh, you don't have to do everything yourself. Um, so it's called ASP.NET Core Helios. It's on NuGet. Uh, it's just version 0 0.1, but I've just added 1.0 just to prove a point. In any case, so what it is, uh, given that we have a people controller, and then uh, you have like API controller, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for instance, you've got a get person. Oh, sorry, uh, you've got get people with a route name, get people. For instance, this is all st standard stuff. This is not specific to my new get package. You have your endpoints and you give it like routes, route, uh, route names and stuff. Routes and route names. That's all you do. Then you reference your application inside. If you want to be generating a URL from your application, you just t ask the router to generate, for instance, the delete person route for me. That's built into ASP.NET Core already. Where my Helios plugin comes in, or NuGet package comes in, is how you add it. On your services, you say add Helios. You pass in options. You say, whenever I'm working with a person DTO object, give me that route and use these parameters. Whenever I'm working with a list as a response type, give me a create person route. Update and delete the same way. When, whenever I'm using a person DTO with an update, um, payload, and also a delete one. So how does this work? Well, it's easy. Let's just uh, assume that this works. The first one is, uh, you know, and also, you, you can use your API with or without a Helios. So you, you can explicitly tell the server, give me a payload with Helios wrapper, or just give me the data. So it's your choice. The first one is the exact same endpoint. The second one is the exact same endpoint with an, an accept header to, to tell it, I don't want normal JSON. I want a JSON with Helios attached to it. So there we go. That's the normal um, payload with uh, a few names. Ex execute the next one. You have additional payload with all links and uh, items. And, and then uh, each item has links and href and rel, which is get person and method get, etc., etc., with your data. Your client, you can have clients that understand the structure. You can have dynamic clients on the fly. You don't need to update the NuGet package on the client side if you made a server side change because some some guy deployed a new endpoint, for instance. Let the server dictate what is available on the fly. It's hard to do this, and this is not for all scenarios, but this is cool. This is Helios. Content type wasn't Helios. Uh, Sorry? JSON plus No, but this is, I'm, uh, this is what, you, what you expected it to be. So it, it's. Yes, but I, I have to say it still. But the idea is the, 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 the formatter is, is looking at this request. But you're right, I have to add it as a, as a proper response. But good spot it. If I had a book, I would have given you one. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. M maybe make one quickly. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I look on my GitHub page. It uh, should be there. In any case. So these are like the 16 or 12, wait, 12, yeah. 12 uh, hidden gems I've uh, sort of uncovered in, uh, in front of your eyes. Uh, it was, it was, some of them, they're, they're pro like probably more, but these are my favorite ones uh, for the specific version. What are your favorite ones? Go, go and really think about it. And then um, go in, go in and explore the framework because the framework is not, <coughs> is not your, your old man's framework. It's the new kid on the block. It's a great framework to work, be, be working on, and it's a great time to be a developer. I should say that kind of thing. It's quite cool. So yeah, um, having, having said that, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, uh, I'll be at the bar. Um, and thank you for listening. <laughs>